Thank you very much, David. That was very enlightening. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Mary Charlotte Bousseau. She is an advisor on service delivery and, and safety at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. Um, remember that you have this form in your bags, so if you have any questions for any of the speakers and the presentations, please write your questions and hand them out to the people who will be collecting them. Richard. Thank you very much, Liliana. Let me first of all express my gratitude to the organizers of this uh, meeting uh, for giving us the opportunity to be together today. It's really a great pleasure and honor for me to have the possibility to participate to this dialogue. And uh, I would like also to thank our host uh, for uh, this very special time in Rome. I have to say it's much colder than in Geneva and there is even much snow. So thank you for all these opportunities. Um, the title which was given to my presentation is also without a question mark, so palliative care improves health. So I took the liberty to um, give some sort of uh, interpretation and first try to share with you why the World Health Organization is working on this issue and how. Uh, first of all, I would like to come back to definitions which are very familiar to all of you. The definition of palliative care, which is actually a current issue of discussion and, and research, and that's a good thing. Um, but in this definition, I think there is some pillars, keywords that uh, are actually the reason why we work all together on palliative care. The quality of life that was mentioned in all presentations already this morning the fact that we're working for patients and their families. The um, reason uh, which is convening our responsibility, which is the life-strengthening condition. And please keep in mind, this has nothing to do with the time, the moment. I think I would be allowed to say in this room that the moment, the time, does not belong to us. So the reason why we have to take care of these patients and their family is their condition whenever the end is actually happening. In this definition, in fact, which is convening the responsibility of the health sector, there is the need to have early identification of needs and uh, early uh, attention to the uh, patients and their family. Another uh, very uh, well-known definition is the definition of health. And as you know, in this definition, health is established as a fundamental right of every human being. More recently, uh, the World Health Assembly adopted, um, by consensus of uh, its uh, 194 member states, a resolution on palliative care. I just want to uh, refer in the introduction of uh, this presentation to one <laughs> sentence, which is uh, actually providing the spirit of our commitment, our work for the well-being of patients is actually serving the human dignity and is, as mentioned already several times this morning, a, an effort to um, serve the person. It's a person-centered uh, effort taking into account the values of the people So having this in mind, I would like first uh, to um, address a point related to the ethical framework of this work and what could be the moral imperative uh, for our commitment in strengthening palliative care 
globally. My second point would be related to the need to transform modalities of care because I'm convinced that palliative care is the best example of integrated people-centered care and is able to transform health system. I will also propose a, a different analogy. You know that uh, over the past decade, the uh, analogy for uh, palliative care strategy was like a sort of umbrella, and I would like to propose to build a house because it's probably more um, comfortable for the patient we have to take care of, and also more complex. And I will end my presentation with a few words on the current activities in the World Health Organization. So our ethical uh, framework is certainly not new uh, from Hippocrates until a more recent uh, policy of the of World Medical Association also represented in, in this room. There is a clear commitment to take care of patients, people suffering, and also um, a clear uh, commitment uh, to avoid abandonment. I think uh, this is something we, we have to keep in mind. Whatever uh, a function we have in the health system. So this ethical duty uh, prohibiting abandonment of patients uh, is the reason why we need to put in place palliative care programs. Abandonment violates uh, the basic princi ethical principles, uh, beneficence or no non-maleficence to take the classical ones, and has been assimilated to torture. If health professionals have this fundamental duty, obviously health systems uh, must provide the condition, and that was very well illustrated already this morning, to fulfill this ethical responsibility for all patients, whatever um, age and disease group. So this is the um, moral imperative for all people working in the health system. The national policies, in addition, uh, must look at two other important principles uh, in order to ensure equitable access to palliative care and also um, to ensure that decision-making processes allow uh, the active participation of everybody, starting with uh, patients and family, from an early stage. So the uh, active autonomous decision. Obviously, uh, as usual in, in bioethics, there is a tension between universal principles and cultural values and the third point of tension is the singular decision. To manage this tension, uh, we need to put in place uh, processes taking into account the specific context where we are. And obviously, palliative care programs will not look the same in Rome, in Delhi, in Kampala, I'm just looking at people I have in front of me. This requires specific training for the providers working in this palliative care programs. So how can we transform the modalities of care to really improve the quality of life of all patients? Historically, um, palliative care was initiated basically within cancer programs and for end of life or dying patients. The current challenges for health systems are much bigger. We need to develop palliative care based on advanced care planning, coordinating the different levels of care, with a specific focus uh, on primary healthcare level and addressing 
complex needs and expectations, sometimes needs and expectations of patients are actually in tension. So I would like to propose to uh, take this analogy of the umbrella because uh, the component of the strategy which was described uh, 10 years ago are definitely the most important and see if uh, in our current work we can also take into account other dimensions. Definitely we will have first the need to provide access to, uh, to drugs, the need to provide good educational program to the uh, public health uh, workers, the need to have good strategies, but maybe we can also complexify a little bit the model. And as I said, I would like to um, discuss with you how we can build the house of palliative care as a real integrated people-centered approach and a cultural transformation of health systems. When we want to build a house, we first have to know where we are because depending on when, where you are, the model will be quite different. And this is definitely something important for a, an international organization like WHO. We will definitely not promote one model. The foundations of the house, um, whatever the model is, is definitely access to uh, opioids and um, more generally essential medicine for palliative care. As you know, 85% uh, of the population of the world still don't have access. So despite the fact that these medicines are on the list of essential medicine uh, in w established by WHO uh, several years ago, this is um, still the main issue for most of the people around the globe. This means appropriate regulations, and to have appropriate regulation, we need international collaboration so countries can share their experience and harmonize these regulations. This is also where advocates are particularly important. The walls of this house are definitely educational programs, but educational programs um, targeting all the stakeholders, fighting opiophobia, and also preventing overprescription of opioids when and where it's the case. Educational programs improving the communication between all the stakeholders, palliative care specialists and others, and considering all the needs and expectation that has to be addressed. In this context, we also have to include the information of the public and I think this is where we need to foster public debate. We need to inform the patients and their, their families, but beyond them, the whole community, as to understand better what we are talking about. And I think, as it was mentioned in the opening of this meeting, it's still a huge problem in many societies. So the media, for example, can be uh, extremely important in promoting um, good palliative care programs. The entry point of these programs um, is definitely the national policy. Well, this is clearly established in the resolution adopted at the World Health Assembly in 2014. Every country should have a national pal policy on palliative care, but not only a policy on palliative care, also component of other national policies addressing the need uh, to strengthen palliative care across disease groups. In many countries, most of the patients in need of palliative care are patients with HIV, for example, or uh, tuberculosis. So it's important to ensure that the palliative care component is everywhere. And based on the specific uh, 
a need assessment of the country in order to avoid a trans transferring problems from one country to another and not addressing the real problems. A key issue uh, in developing these uh, national policy is the development of good indicators. And fortunately, uh, many people in this room are working on this uh, because I have to say um, it's, uh, it's a big challenge for the organization to have good indicators to monitor the policy because uh, policy makers uh, don't like to strengthen program if they don't uh, have uh, some tools for measurement. It's definitely an issue for better research. In this house of palliative care we have to build together, there is multiple approaches to address the complexity of needs. And I think the different windows of this uh, house are actually represented in this room uh, with the diversity of actors, chaplains working with nurses, uh, physicians uh, with a psychologist. This is absolutely a key success factor for the building of the program. But above all, um, maybe, I don't know, maybe missing in this room, uh, people um, from a patient organization, patients themselves, uh, family caregivers. I think we have to make a particular effort to uh, bring this voice in our discussion and in the construction of uh, this um, new house for palliative care. On the top, uh, I already mentioned the public uh, debate and I think what is uh, particularly important uh, in this debate is also to have a social commitment on modalities. Uh, in some countries, uh, it could be advanced directives. In other countries, uh, these modalities would be completely different. But to ensure that the decision-making process is very well known by everybody and uh, allow uh, actually to address the complex needs of the people, not only to control physical symptoms. In this, um, uh, I think the, the cultural uh, uh, aspect is, is crucial, and maybe it's both way. The discussion on palliative care can also uh, help societies to um, go through important cultural changes and clarify their uh, responsibility as we were asked to do uh, this morning um, with regard to the most vulnerable. So what WHO is doing on this? Well, um, following the adoption of the uh, World Health Assembly resolution, uh, a number of uh, tools have been uh, developed to implement this global commitment. There is already uh, one manual which is available uh, for um, the planning and implementing of palliative care program with a focus on places where uh, there is very few uh, things available. We are currently developing three other specific uh, tools uh, to implement palliative care for children, uh, palliative care at primary health care level. This is, uh, as I mentioned, a priority for us. And also palliative care in a specific context, which is um, the response to humanitarian uh, emergencies and crises. Uh, some of you in this room are also part of a, an expert group developing guidelines for uh, the management of cancer pain treatment in, in adults. This will be available this year. And we have also a number of communication tools which can facilitate the dialogue at country level. Uh, we have opened a community of practice where uh, experts 
uh, can share their experience in different countries. And we want also to learn from good and bad experiences uh, in different countries and to share and, uh, and, and be able to analyze these experience to propose um, suggestions to, to other country. Just to illustrate um, what I was mentioning in order to um, coordinate better the different stakeholders working in these palliative care programs, we are currently um, initiating a study to look at the potential benefit of a tool like a, a mobile application to provide information to family caregivers and also allow family caregivers to communicate better with a palliative care team. This will start soon in three countries, in Zimbabwe, Uganda, and, and India. And based on the result, uh, we hope to be able to um, give some recommendation to countries um, in order to uh, use better this kind of uh, technologies. I want to end um, referring to an opportunity which is important this year. As you know, uh, we will celebrate uh, this year the 14th anniversary of the Almata Declaration. And I think it's important to ensure uh, palliative care will be explicit in the uh, new uh, declaration of Almata. We are doing all our best uh, in order to, to ensure this, but it's very important to have a global commitment uh, to ensure that palliative care should be available everywhere at primary healthcare level. It's also important because uh, it's a commitment for the development of integrated people-centered care. Another uh, important issue for um, the time being is uh, the commitment to develop more evidence and to strengthen the research in the field of palliative care. So in conclusion, uh, I would like to come back to the people we are serving. I think uh, if, if we want uh, to really make a difference, not only at the very end of life, but in the sense of our life, in the sense of uh, our community, we need to take very concrete measures. And this commitment is a global commitment, is a personal commitment, is a social commitment. I think uh, the duty we, we share all together is uh, the duty to respond to these uh, people wherever they, they are. It's probably doing this that we will know better why we have an interest in our daily work. Thank you very much.